Hi, everybody. I'd like to thank uh, everybody tuning in uh, from Facebook Live and from Zoom right now. For those of you new to Taste of Science, we're a part of a 501c3 for science outreach, and we'd usually be holding a big in-person science festival, inviting you to meet your friendly neighborhood scientist in your favorite spaces. But these days, the only space we have right now is in our homes and online, so we're going digital. These events are a collaboration between our many city chapters. I'm Nancy Mack from the Philadelphia chapter, and tonight we're joined by Dr. Ramesh Raghupathy, professor in the Department of Neurobiology and Anatomy at Drexel University College of Medicine. Dr. Raghupathy's research explores how the brain responds to traumatic injury, ranging from molecules to behavior. Dr. Agapathy has an exciting talk prepared for us today that's been split into two parts. If you have questions during either part one or part two of today's talk, you can enter those questions as comments on the Facebook live stream or enter them into the Q&A chat box if you're joining us via Zoom. We've got volunteers compiling these questions behind the scenes and they'll be feeding these questions to me where I'll be reading them to Dr. Dr. Raghupathy for a Q&A after part one and part two. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to turn the show over to Dr. Raghupathy uh, to get his talk, talk started. Thank you, Nancy. I am going to share my screen now. Okay. And let's start here. and then make sure I have my laser pointer on. Okay, great. Uh, again, thank you, Nancy, and thank you all for taking time out of your evening to, or to join, join us for this uh, uh, session. Uh, I'm very pleased and honored to, be, have, to have been invited to buy Taste of Science to share uh, some of the concepts having to do with uh, traumatic brain injury, a subject that is near and dear to my heart. I've been working on this for almost 30 years. Uh, so what I am going to talk to you today about is the neuroscience of uh, traumatic brain injuries. But before I get started, I want to make uh, a disclaimer. I am a neuroscientist. I am not a clinician. My goal here through this talk is to educate uh, those of who have joined in on the causes and consequences of traumatic brain injuries and uh, give you a flavor of some of the basic science research that goes on in, in my lab with the idea that it helps in the development of treatment strategies. So I don't intend for any of what I'm going to be saying as either diagnoses or treatments for patients that is the purview of your clinician, uh, whether it's a neurologist or a primary care physician or a uh, orthopedist. Okay, so traumatic brain injury has been with us for a long time. One of the first known uh, indicators that traumatic brain injury was part of the psyche of, uh, the, of the human race came from these... Uh, translations of the Edwin Smith papyrus uh, that was excavated from, the, uh, from Egypt. And these uh, were dated to somewhere about the 1650 to 1550 before current era. And it actually was translated uh, to show that this was at that time uh, a treatise on the treatment of battle wounds. And so what you see here, and this is actually a, a very nice um, a uh, summary of this work from Sanchez and Burridge in 2007, where you can see here on the uh, left-hand side of your screen, the original papyrus, where pieces of it have been taken and translated uh, from the original uh, hieroglyphics, and where this talks about presumably a, some, an injury uh, caused by uh, this uh, uh, mace type of uh, uh, device, presumably during a battle 
where it talks about the smashing of the patient's cranium, the exposure of the brain. You can see the fact that there is a large fracture and the dura, the membrane enveloping the brain has been exposed. What is also interesting is that within the diagnosis section, the physician has basically said, this is a medical condition that you will not be able to treat. So this probably fits in the context of a severe TBI. However, there is a recommended treatment about not bandaging it, but dabbing oil on top of the uh, wound and allowing the patient to quote unquote, pass the crisis. Uh, further evidence from the fact that brain injuries were surgically at least uh, evaluated comes from these uh, isolate uh, from the findings of these skulls from as early as 6500 before current era from excavation sites in France and Russia and then more recently in pre-Columbian Mesoamericans in South America. And what we find is there are these skulls with these holes and there's been some identification of some of these uh, uh, devices or uh, instruments that is used that, have, that were used for a practice no, known as trepanation or trephination. And the fact is, if you, and if you look carefully at some of these, you can see that there are different types. So this suggests that the physicians may have been trying to practice on the kind of uh, trephination that they can perform or what is apparent from this image here is that the bone has actually healed. That suggests that this patient survived the actual surgical procedure. A case to be noted here is the fact that trephination or trepanation as it was in the, uh, in, in, in the prehistoric times and in the uh, more recent uh, 17th, 18th century was actually a precursor to the a currently practiced technique called decompressive craniotomy or decompressive craniectomy that is even used even today by neurosurgeons to relieve intracranial pressure after severe uh, traumatic brain injuries. And of course, we always knew this, uh, we always had this uh, nursery rhyme where we talked about Jack and Jill falling down and Jack injuring his head. And in fact, the next paragraph talks about some uh, type of treatment where you bind his uh, head with vinegar and brown paper. So there has been a recognition for uh, TBI all the way back to the uh, Middle Ages, but more recently, and this is a uh, uh, opinion uh, piece from the then chair of the uh, um, the director of the National Institute of Neurological Disease and Stroke, Dr. Murray Goldstein, who then called, coined the term at the beginning of the decade of the brain in 1990 as the traumatic brain injury as a silent epidemic. And as part of that, he identified epidemiological statistics of the incidence of head injuries and how many required hospital admission, what the mortality was, and more importantly, what the, at that time the cost to society was, which is about $35 billion. So more recently, these statistics uh, from the CDC demonstrate that those numbers haven't really changed a whole lot. In fact, this is from about 20 years ago. So a more recent uh, visit to the CDC page will say that this has gone up actually to almost 2 million emergency department visits per year in the United States. So obviously this is a significant problem uh, that is part of the medical issues within this country. So what causes TBI? So the standard causes of TBI, as we all know, are motor vehicle accidents and falls and, and also gunshot wounds and stab wounds. So th those uh, are, are some major causes, but there are other causes too from uh, in terms of um, in terms of blast uh, explosions and uh, uh, other types of uh, injuries. So what I wanted to talk about is give you a brief overview of how uh, neurosurgeons and neurologists and clinicians see head injuries. And so we classify head injuries into couple of different categories based on the type of injury that's seen. The first kind is called a focal injury, which is usually associated with a skull fracture uh, 
bleeding and is visible on either a uh, CT scan or an X-ray. So for example, what you see here is this very white spot uh, is indication of bleeding in, on top of the brain or even within the brain. And so this clearly indicates that this patient has suffered, uh, these patients have suffered a moderate to severe brain injury. Obviously the most, most uh, uh, but the most famous case of a focal brain injury is that of Phineas Gage, a railroad worker in New England, who was, while, while insta installing the railroad track, what came too close to a railroad spike that was impaled, that impaled him because of an explosion. And as you can see, this is a reconstruction based on his skull and uh, fragments of his uh, skull that were found in his, in his grave. And this was a reconstruction back uh, in 1994 that shows the railroad spike having entered through his eye, going right through his uh, prefrontal cortex, the frontal lobe of his brain, uh, very clearly. What is interesting is the fact that Phineas Gage recovered from this. Uh, and originally people thought that this, because it damaged his frontal lobe, that it actually changed his personality substantially from being a God-fearing man to somebody who became a, an alcoholic and a very aggressive person. However, that, that uh, hypothesis has been questioned. The one thing that is clear that is as a result of his brain injury, he did go on to develop seizures and uh, that led to his early, uh, early death. So what are the other kinds? So the, what about the biomechanics of uh, brain injuries? How does this happen? So obviously, for example, you can have an impact or you can have a uh, motor vehicle accident, which is a very common cause. And what I wanted to point out here is that in the case of not wearing a seatbelt in the absence of an airbag, you're going to have an impact in addition to having acceleration, deceleration forces. Whereas with the airbag, what you are going to see is the fact that there's not going to be an impact on the windshield. However, there's definitely going to be acceleration, deceleration uh, forces. The second type of head injury that we see is called diffuse head injuries, otherwise referred to as diffuse axonal injury. This is the kind of injury that we also see in concussions, something that I will get to in the second part in, uh, later in this talk. But here, as you can see in a CT scan, there is no evidence of a skull fracture. The brain looks reasonably normal. However, in doing more uh, Ac uh, more uh, extensive imaging, and this is more, uh, this is MRI imaging, you can see these areas of the brain showing up as white, and that is, indicates that there is brain damage within the brain, though not on the surface of the brain. In part, this has to do with shearing forces, so the movement of the brain within the skull, and I'll show you some examples of that in the next slide. So for example, here, this is an example of a uh, uh, what uh, someone who is going to uh, who is going to let me see how can I start this. So this is a a, a, a motor vehicle accident, but this is a uh, rear ending. So what you can see is that there is the movement. There is uh, this is a typical whiplash type of injury where you're going to see damage to the, uh, to the spinal cord, but you also have the brain moving within the skull, hitting the inside of the skull and causing damage uh, throughout, throughout the front and front to back uh, part of the brain. So this, for example, would be a situation where uh, there is both linear acceleration and deceleration, but there is also rotational. And I want to point out that very quickly here, you can see the head turning ever so slowly. This is in slow motion. So you can see the rotational part of it before the linear acceleration shows up. So, so this actually answers the first myth that we had posted. Does TBI occur only if there's an impact to the head? And the answer to that question is obviously not necessarily because whiplash types of injuries where there's 
extensive acceleration deceleration forces can also cause brain injury for the because the brain moves within the skull it is bathed in a, a fluid called the cerebrospinal fluid Here's another example of where you don't necessarily need to have a uh, uh, impact. So this is a video of a improvised explosive device in, uh, and you can see here, I'd like to point out this wave, this sound wave, this pressure wave coming from that explosion. And therefore that the physics of that blast wave it allows, uh, it indicates that it's going to transfer through the skull and move the head within, move the brain within the head. So again, to see that, you can see the effect from such far away, the camera has fallen off. You can see the effect of that pressure wave. And so this really drives home the idea that you can have a concussion or a mild brain injury just because of the brain moving within the skull without an actual evidence of an impact. So that brings up the question, what is a concussion therefore? A concussion is a brain injury that results from a force that's transmitted to the head and therefore to the brain, either through a collision or through non-colliding forces, movement around off the head, off the brain within the skull that could lead to damage to both the tissue, brain tissue, and the vasculature of the brain. What happens when you have a concussion? Very early on, you're going to uh, have a compendium of symptoms, in signs and symptoms, including dizziness and nausea, sometimes with uh, blurred vision, lack of coordination, being disoriented, and maybe a very, uh, on occasion, you can have loss of consciousness. Now, you don't have to have a loss of consciousness to be, uh, uh, to be uh, diagnosed with a concussion. However, one thing to keep in mind is that the majority of these signs and symptoms uh, will resolve within days. And if the deficits don't resolve after three months, then the patient is diagnosed with having post-concussive syndrome. So let's uh, talk about a, a few myths when we talk about concussions. So one of the first myth is that a player who gets dinged hasn't suffered a concussion where the uh, confusional state is resolved within minutes. Well, that's not necessarily true because usually when signs and symptoms are present at the t from the time of injury, some of them will not appear until several hours or even days or weeks later. Uh, for example, uh, headaches is something that can happen a few hours afterwards and, and may or may not resolve within three months. And that's a very good indication of suffering from post-concussive syndrome. What is, how, how do you recover from a concussion? How do you treat a concussion? And that's the second myth that you have to stay in a dark room with no physical or mental activity until the symptoms disappear. And part of this is also that you want to make sure that you don't fall asleep. Neither of those two are true. In fact, data, more recent day clinical data seems to suggest that a gradual return to activity is far better than complete and total absence of physical or mental activity. And sleep is actually beneficial in aiding that recovery. There's one uniform treatment for concussion. And again, this is a myth that needs to be uh, answered. And basically the treatment strategies that one has for, that physicians will provide for a concussed patient is, going, is tailored to the patient. It is going to depend on the age of the patient, it's going to depend on the gender, it's going to depend on how many concussions that they've had and how, and how soon after the concussion they have been uh, seen by the patient. So here's, so when we talk about concussions, everybody knows about football players and that's essentially what, how we have all become so aware of this. As you can see here, this addresses another myth. The fact that if you have helmets and or mouth guards, you can prevent concussions. As you can see from this video, that is clearly not the case. Here's a helmet to helmet impact and there is the player falling down. Uh, showing signs of a, a, a concussion. He has lost consciousness right there. 
So why do we want to talk about football related injuries? Well, football related injuries has come up with this new condition, relative a new condition, seemingly new condition called chronic traumatic encephalopathy. So one thing to keep in mind is the fact that the that chronic traumatic encephalopathy was actually a term that was coined back in the 40s. It was at that time called punch drunk syndrome because it was identified in brains of boxers who were subjected to multiple concussions. So in the rejuvenation of this term more recently due to the studies with brains from uh, retired and uh, football players, is the fact that CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy or CTE is a progressive neurodegenerative disease that is associated with rep repetitive head impacts. And so it is distinct from the, uh, what, we, what I spoke about, uh, this distinct from post-concussion syndrome. So this is not just a consequence of a long-term behavioral problems in these, in these uh, athletes. The symptoms come because of the progressive loss of function of the cells within the brain, progressive uh, appearance of more dying cells within the brain. And usually these symptoms will present about a couple of decades after the exposure to the repetitive head trauma. So usually midlife to uh, uh, older or in older uh, athletes. So earlier on, as they, uh, these symptoms begin to show, you will find that the players will, the, the, these retired players will complain about short-term memory problems. They will have depressions, emotional problems, impulse control behaviors, and suicidal behaviors. And then as these uh, symptoms progress towards the end of life, they find that memory impairment has become worse. They become much more aggressive. Uh, in fact, and start to show signs of severe dementia. But keep in mind that at this point, to this day, diagnosis of CTE is only made at post-mortem, uh, at the post-mortem level, and is made based on pathologic uh, evaluation of brain tissue. Here's an example of a bunch of uh, st uh, samples, and this is work from Anne McKee and her group at Boston University and the VA and the uh, database that uh, data bank that she has accumulated of retired athletes who have been subjected to repetitive brain trauma. And what you find here is these brown spots throughout the brain and various parts. And this, this brown, these brown spots is indicative of uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. What are these brown spots? These brown spots are actually accumulation of a protein that is present in the nervous system called tau. And it's present in nervous system cells and also around blood vessels. So what is tau? Tau is a uh, microtubule associated protein that is critical for maintaining microtubule structure. Yes, I understand that's a lot of jargon. So let's break it down for you. What is a, microtub what is a microtubule? Microtubules are those proteins that are present in nerve cells that are integral to maintaining the structure of these nerve cells. And by doing so, they're also integral to the function of these nerve cells. So the microtubules make the nerve cells function, uh, live, maintain the structure of these uh, nerve cells and provide functionality to these nerves, support the functionality of these nerve cells. In turn, tau provides support, structural support to these microtubules. So you lose tau, you lose microtubules, you lose microtubules, uh, you lose neurons or nerve cells. So how does uh, tau work? So in a healthy neuron, tau stabilizes these microtubules. So keeps them happy, keeps them healthy, keeps them in a, in a uniform structure. When tau goes bad, these microtubules fall apart. And therefore, if, there's, if the core structure of the cell falls apart, the cell itself is going to fall apart. So how does tau Hi guys, uh, bear with us while we get, oh, and he's back online. I didn't even have time to finish. <laughs> Thanks for, thank you, Dr. Agapathy.
Yeah, sorry. Let me. There you go. Okay. There you go. I'm back. Sorry about that. That's the uh, the bad side of uh, technology. So when these uh, tau gets too many of these phosphates on there, it falls off, and this and this bad tau therefore starts to accumulate, and that's what you saw as those brown spots in the brain sections. So we've talked about the humans, but what what do we know from animals? And there's a couple of different animal species that do share some of these qualities of having, quote unquote, putting themselves out there to sustain concussions or brain injuries. One example is that of the big horn sheep. And as you can see here, here's an example. And there you can see the head on collision of two of these rams. How do they actually suffer concussions? We don't think so. And we don't think so because one, they there's two reasons one they actually the full point of contact is the horns not the actual heads second the force by which that these uh he these heads butt each other is 60 times more than what would take if you did that 60 times greater than what is necessary to crack the human skull. So you, this is a very high level of force. Mm -hmm. However, these animals have evolved where the skulls have these large sutures, these gaps between these plates that actually give when on, on impact. And what happens is that that absorbs all the forces and does not transmit it to the brain. And so the brain does not get damaged. Another example is the woodpecker. And that's the classic case of where you can see the woodpecker and that's on the upper left-hand panel is the, uh, is it in, in real life. And this is in slow motion, real speed and real time. And this is in slow motion. You can see that you can see that the head itself doesn't move because of the beak. And so when you look at the structure of the uh, head of the woodpecker, there are three things I want to point out. First, here's the brain of the woodpecker. It, unlike the human brain, is very tightly enclosed within the skull. There is no fluid. So unlike the human brain, which sloshes about in that cerebrospinal fluid, this brain is very tightly attached to the skull. Second, you can see that the tongue of this uh, bird wraps around the brain, providing additional uh, uh, forces to stabilize the brain. Third, the eyes don't pop out because there's a third eyelid that protects the eyes and keeps it in its socket. And finally, the, the most important part is that there are small bones and cartilages right here within the, at the end of the beak called hyoid apparatus. And what that does is works as an accordion. And when the, uh, when the uh, beak hits the tree, those forces are absorbed by this. It accordions in and therefore keeps the forces from not going in to the brain. So that's how the woodpecker protects itself. However, somebody asked the question, do woodpeckers develop uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy? And so a recent study showed that when they looked at brains of woodpeckers, there was some evidence of this deposition of that tau, these brown spots that you saw, very similar to what we saw in the human brain, although nowhere near to the extent of what was observed in the patients that had uh, full-blown CTE. So at this point, I think I will stop and turn it over to Nancy and uh, hopefully there are some questions we can answer on the first part uh, of, of the talk on traumatic brain injuries. Nancy? All right, thank you, Dr. Agupathy. Um, we've got a ton of questions coming in, so I'll just go ahead and uh, get this Q&A started. Uh, so the first question I have for you is, why do some head injuries cause seizures? So a very, very important question, very good point. So we think that 
when the neuro, uh, the nerve cells, the neurons within the brain get damaged, what they do is as if they don't survive, if they don't die, then, and, and if they survive, sometimes they will form uh, what we refer to as aberrant connections. So they can get uh, much, they form the incorrect connections because whatever neurons that they were connected to may have died or the other uh, supporting cells within the brain, like the astrocytes and the microglia, what we call the glia, uh, could uh, in some ways uh, affect the connectivity between cells. And what happens to those neurons is that they become hyperactive. And when they become hyperactive, uh, they, they, the, the patient seizes. The other thing is that, as you probably know, Nancy, these neurons all fire very synchronously. And so it's a very orchestrated, organized event of firing. That's how signals get transmitted. When that synchronicity is lost and they fire in very random manner, in a very random manner, that can also contribute to seizure development. Great. Uh, so kind of related to that, uh, to this aberrant firing and aberrant, um, aberrant connectivity, someone wants to know what the effect of inflammation in uh, TBI or CTE is, and perhaps maybe that inflammation might be related uh, to what you were just describing. Yes, actually inflammation has become a very important research topic um, in the recent five to six years, particularly in the context of TBI, there are two schools of thought. One is the fact that there is the, uh, the, the inflammation could serve as a protective role where they can come in and work as sort of phagocytic cells and um, take away all the debris from the dying and dead uh, brain cells. And uh, but if they continue to stay there, they can secrete factors that contribute to the ongoing degeneration. So TBI, like a lot of neurodegenerative disease like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, um, is an ongoing process. And so part of that is that as these neurons, as these nerve cells start to undergo degeneration with time, um, the inflammation that occurs may be part of the uh, part of the contributing factors to that degeneration. Fascinating stuff. So we've got two questions uh, related uh, to Phineas Gage. So I'm gonna try to ask them together. Okay. Um, so similar to Phineas Gage, uh, there have been a few well-publicized cases of people having accidents uh, with nail guns and not realizing that anything was wrong. So people want to know how is it that a nail has been inserted into their brains but they don't notice um and then secondly why is it that gage had a personality change and are there other cases of head injuries that have also caused personality changes so let me answer the second question first in fact and that really we get that from sort of the more recent evidence of the the cte cases if you know when when a a uh, football player who has been uh, subjected to multiple head uh, concussions uh, over his uh, over his or her um, playing career, you find that there once when he passes away, uh, his family talks about how his personality changed. He went from this very nice, gentle person to this very aggressive, angry person who could you know has a very had a very short fuse. So that's indication of a personality change. So yes, that has happened even in the absence of any focal injuries. This is a what we refer to as a diffuse injury. So it, it's it, it's a repetitive, it's this repetitive nature of the injury. So there's more and more evidence coming out about personality changes, mostly because a lot of the brain structures involved in the personality, like the frontal lobe, the temporal lobe, are affected, and because the if you think about the biomechanics, and that's what I like, that's what I wanted to show you how the brain moves within the skull. It's very easy to see how the entire brain is affected rather than just one part of the brain. So that explains that. Now, going back to, so th th it's a very interesting, this is one of those uh, very interesting concepts and uh, ideas. So people have had a nail gun fired into their head in intentionally or otherwise. Sometimes, 
the, 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 if the object goes between lobes, it doesn't go into the lobe. And so remember, when you look at, when, when you see the human brain, you have three structures. You have the gray matter, which is all the cells. You have the white matter, which is all the axons, which is a very different material. And they're not, they just sit on top of each other. And there are parts of that that are connected, but for the most part, there, there are the, these lobes are kind of separate. They might, there are points of connection, but they're not connected all the way through. And then the third part is, uh, is the, are the blood vessels. And there's blood vessels on top and there's blood vessels in between. So it really depends on where the object goes. Sometimes it can go between lobes. Sometimes it can go into the blood vessel and follow the arc of the blood vessel. So it's possible that some of these, that these objects don't really affect brain uh, the, the individual cells within the brain, but rather affect the whole overall structure. Interesting. Okay, we've got some questions coming in from Facebook that I want to get a chance to ask. Uh, so Emma from Facebook wants to know, why does phosphorylated tau accumulate as a result of TBI? Well, it's not just phosphorylated tau, it's hyperphosphorylated tau. And what we think is happening, much like what happens in Alzheimer's, is that this hyperphosphorylated tau tends to become very sticky as a result of having too many phosphates, and they form these fibrils. And these fibrils, once the nucleus of that fibril forms, then other tau molecules begin to stick to it. So there's the core of this phosphorylated tau that's hyperphosphorylated tau that's formed. And so related to that, somebody else wants to know, tau is implicated in Alzheimer's disease. So do we see any similarities in the progression of brain injury between Alzheimer's disorder and TBI? Uh, so yes and no. So that's one of the reasons why we said, why we call the disease CTE, which is a concept which is related to TBI, is that the predominant deposition of tau seems to be around blood vessels. Whereas in Alzheimer's, it tends to be more in, within neurons, not necessarily associated with blood vessels. So that's one distinction between Alzheimer-related tau pathology and CTE-related tau pathology, the prevalence of tau deposition around blood vessels and CTE. Now, What's interesting, there, is a, there have been a number of studies that have shown that one of the major environmental risk factors for non-familial Alzheimer's, so non-genetic Alzheimer's, is TBI. So moderate to severe TBI does change the metabolism of the amyloid precursor protein and does facilitate the depos formation and deposition of amyloid plaques. So That's coupled really with the amyloid plaques and the uh, altered phosphorylation state and microtubule changes in, uh, in after injury, they both collect together can facilitate the development of early onset non-familial uh, Alzheimer's as a result of the brain injury. Okay, and then the last question we have time for in part one comes from Jennifer McCarthy on Zoom. Uh, and this is a question I know that, uh, I personally know that you'll be interested in. So does a toddler who suffers from concussion heal faster than an adult due to their skull not being fully knitted and having more developing neurons? Uh, actually, no, and I will hold the answer to that question when I get to the second part because one of the very first slides shows how age is uh, related to, uh, age at injury is related to the uh, epidemiology of brain injuries. <laughs> okay, we're looking forward to it. So that's all the time we have for questions for part one. Uh, if I didn't get to your question during this segment, I'll try to ask it during our second Q&A uh, at the end of the talk. Um, I'm now gonna turn the show back over to Dr. Raghupathy uh, for the remainder of his presentation. Thank you, Nancy. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so uh, let me see. What am I? Uh, 
Ben. Okay, so these concussion episodes, these brain injury episodes begin early in life. So here's a game, here's a PV football game, and there you can see there's a collision, there's, there's a child who has essentially been laid out with a concussion. And so you can see that this is not something that you, one has to wait to become an adult to, to experience. Uh, you also have uh, adolescents, uh, teenagers, pre-teenagers uh, kind of do silly things that results in them getting uh, their, their head hurt. Uh, here's, a, here's one example of uh, an accident off of a bike. And here's uh, the same thing that happens in the context. And I want to uh, very quickly point out something right here. Notice the hands. That is referred to as the fencing response. Uh, and you will, uh, and that's, that is a clear indication of, of a concussion that has just happened. And you'll notice in both, in all three cases, these two uh, examples and the football, again, all these kids were wearing a helmet. So it's not just that they don't wear a helmet. This is the slide that I was talking about. So adolescents are at a higher risk for concussions. As you can see here, uh, in the age range of 15 to 19, the number of emergency department visits is is at an all time high relative to all the other ages with the exception of the youngest age group. So you can see that there are these kids or the infants uh, that are uh, also being subjected to uh, head injuries. Now, there's, this is not one of the myths that I, that I want to address here is that, and it goes back to the question that was asked earlier, it is not the case that the youngest uh, members of the rate of the human uh, the human patient population are more resistant in fact they're likely to be the least resistant and the most vulnerable and that's because although their skulls haven't fully formed the brain does swell but what happens is as a result of the injury the developmental processes of that are ongoing get interrupted and that has a more of a negative consequence as these children age into adolescence and adulthood. So really, they're probably looking at a lifetime of disability and debilitating behavioral problems from the injury that they suffered early in life. It, this is pretty much the case with the adolescents too, because I mean, even though they are a little older, they're more between the ages of 12 and uh, 19, as they still are, they will survive the concussion, but they will go on in time to develop uh, behavioral problems. This is particularly becoming more common in athletes that play contact sports at the, at the high, middle school, high school, and even at the early collegiate level. And it's been shown that these high school athletes who suffer a concussion take about two to three times longer to recover than their older counterparts. That's partly because of the fact that when these uh, brains, uh, when the uh, adolescent undergoes a, con a concussion, that this sets in place, uh, sets in motion a series of events that leads to structural damage. So here's an example of where, looking at the prefrontal cortex, which is the part of the brain in the frontal lobe that is the last to develop in the human brain, and this is undergoing development at the time of injury, we find that when these uh, children grow into adulthood, they have about a 50% smaller volume of this prefrontal cortex. So their decision-making skills in part are affected. It's not just the cortex, but it's also these areas of the brain called the white matter, which is where the axons are, which are the connecting fibers between cells. And you can see here that in almost every, there's an increased fractional anisotropy. So the black bars are higher. What that means is that those fiber tracks are less uh, structurally organized, which means it's a sign of brain damage. 
Now, there's another important point to this. Girls actually sustain more concussions than boys do. Now, if you look at this uh, curve here, which uh, quantifies the number of concussions per 1,000 uh, athletic exposures, meaning 1,000 uh, uh, athletes, you'll find that boys are far greater than girls. That's because we have now included football players in this, in this mix. And obviously more boys play football than girls do. But if you take away football or you start to compare the sports that both boys and girls play, volleyball, soccer, lacrosse, for example, and basketball, then we find that girls are about two and a half times more likely to sustain a concussion. And what I want to show you here is that, and soccer is the one sport that first highlighted this, and it's, it was originally, and this is another myth, it was thought that the concussions come from heading the ball. Well, not completely. And what I'd like, I'm going to play this video, and what I'd like you to pay attention to is the point of impact of the players. And you'll note that the two players that uh, hit each other, that impact each other, it's their heads hitting each other's heads, not the ball. So let me go back and play this video. So here it is. Here's the ball coming up. There's this. Boom. So you can see both those girls, actually the ball wasn't touched at all. It was the head hitting the head. And that's really what causes the problem. Uh, secondarily, there's a second round of impact when the heads now hit the turf. Uh, and so it's a double hit uh, within, the ma within a matter of seconds. So not only are the girls more likely to sustain concussions, but they take longer to recover. This is a study from a couple of years ago, which a recent study from the Children's Hospital of uh, Philadelphia also substantiated this for players from the greater Philadelphia area where the girls took about uh, almost uh, twice the length of time to recover from the concussion than their age matched male counterparts. As, as we go in time from the injury, we can also start to look at the likelihood of them showing uh, behavioral problems. And I've highlighted here in a number of different uh, outcomes from headache to uh, depression, girls are more likely to suffer consequences than their male counterparts. So they report more symptoms, they take longer to recover, and they also have different symptoms than, um, than the boys do. So I brought up this term before called post-concussive syndrome. These are when the deficits remain after 90 days. One of the most uh, common uh, post-concussive syndrome other than headache is depression and anxiety. And a history of concussion is associated with an elevated risk of developing uh, depression later in life, particularly in the adolescence and it can go as much as almost a decade later that they start to show depressive types of depressive type of behavior. So we wanted to answer this question in the laboratory. So we had to develop a model of concussion in, in a rat model. And so we turned to an adolescent rat. So an adolescent rat so is about a 35 to 40 day old rat. Uh, this is equivalent in age to a human between the age of 12 and 19. And we simulated the injury in an anesthetized animal by allowing a metal impactor to impact the skull of the animal. It does not cause a skull fracture. The animal recovers almost immediately from this injury. And the uh, physical forces that are impacted, that are imparted by this indenter onto the skull and the movement of the head on this base plate is very similar to what you just saw where the, there was a head on head impact and then a consequent uh, and a subsequent impact to the ground. So the same level of physical forces. And what we found when we did this was that just a single concussion was able to generate a depression like behavior in the female rat, but not in the male rat. So you can see here in this test, which we use, we allow the rat to swim in a 
a, a, a tub of water. And after a while, it kind of gives up and starts to float. And an animal is known to be depressed if the amount of time that it spends floating is longer than it spends swimming. And that's exactly what you see here. You find that in the injured animal, that these animals float a lot more than they swim, uh, and they float a lot more than the male animal. What was interesting about this, that we only saw this behavior in the female animal, and we only saw it about five to six weeks after the injury, so well into adulthood. So sort of maintaining that same time frame that I referred to earlier on with the depressive phenotype, really shows up about a decade or so after injury. So we wanted to ask the question, one of the things we're interested in is, what is the basis? What is the neurochemical basis for this behavior? Because by understanding the neurochemical basis, maybe we can develop some sort of intervention that can help the patient. And so there's a couple of different neurotransmitters that have been implicated in depression type behavior. The one is serotonin and the other is dopamine. And this is just a map to show you where the serotonin is made, which is a structure called the dorsal raphe, but you can see that it expands to, it, it reaches almost all parts of the brain. And the, where the dopamine is made is called uh, the ventral tegmental area, and that also reaches all parts of the brain. So both of these are, have been implicated in multiple behaviors, including depression. So we tested this idea that the hypothesis is that the reason why there's depressive behavior is because there's less of the dopamine and there's less of the serotonin. And so what we did was we treated these animals with a molecule called Ritalin. And you may know Ritalin from the fact that it's been used in humans for ADHD. It's a molecule that prevents, that increases dopamine levels by preventing its reuptake. So it's a reuptake inhibitor. And when we focus your attention on this uh, red box here, you can see that compared to animals that didn't get any treatment, the animals, the injured animals that were treated with Ritalin showed absolute complete return to baseline in terms of depressive behavior. So we completely eliminated the depressive behavior. Similarly, if you use a molecule called sertraline, which is an SSRI or a serotonin reuptake inhibitor, that also release, uh, reduces the depression-like behavior. Uh, shown in this in this red box. So both the dopamine and the serotonin system have been implicated. Our current studies are looking at what the cellular and molecular mechanisms are that these molecules, these two neurotransmitters work in terms of not just regulating depression, but how they can show sex dependent uh, changes in the uh, uh, in, in, in the context of uh, mild traumatic brain injury. So I'd like to uh, end here, but not before I acknowledge the person who did most, if not all of this work, my former PhD student, Laura Giacometti, who is currently doing a phenomenal job as a postdoctoral fellow in uh, Dr. Jackie Barker's lab at the Department of Pharmacology and funding from this, uh, from both the NIH and the Pennsylvania Department of Health that supported this work. So at this point, I will stop and take more questions and I will uh, uh, switch it over to Nancy. Thank you, Dr. Aguhati, for that fascinating talk. Um, so again, we've got a lot of questions coming in. Um, I'm happy, uh, your talk actually panned out very nicely for one question I didn't get to uh, from Dr. Linda Chamberlain on Facebook, who wanted to know if concussion can cause uh, any type of emotional problems. Uh, so I'm glad that uh, you were able to answer that without me getting there. Uh, so another question uh, fr from Emma on Facebook wants to know, uh, in addition to these dopamine uh, and serotonin targeting molecules, uh, do you think treating with anti-inflammatory might help, uh, anti-inflammatory molecules might help treat the brain during this? Yes. In fact, uh, I obviously, in the interest of time, I didn't have a chance to get into this, but there is a, there is a project going on in the lab that is looking at uh, using anti-inflammatory types of molecules uh, to prevent brain injury-induced uh, uh, damage. And what we are finding is that the timing is very important. 
So the treatment with these anti-inflammatory molecules needs to be timed in such a way that it can help the recovery of the brain rather than hurt the recovery of the brain. Um, an anonymous question uh, from Zoom wants to know, what other animal, animal models, uh, in addition to the ones you've showed, are being used to investigate uh, TBI or CTE? Uh, the other model that's been used is in the mouse. And there are people who are working uh, with uh, pigs. Uh, the advantage of using, and then there is actually a uh, one person that I know is working with rabbits. Uh, in the past, uh, the original TBI literature back from the 60s used uh, ferrets and cats. Uh, and the reason for using animals like ferrets, cats, rabbits, is that their brain structure looks very similar to the human brain structure compared to the brain structure of rats and mice. So there are certain advantages of using uh, those animals from with respect to their brain structure. Uh, now, particularly if you think about the pig, uh, the size of the brain is also large enough that it can accommodate some of the more, uh, uh, you know, relevant physical forces, for example, in a blast type of injury or in a motor vehicle accident. So we've got a ton of questions coming in on dopamine and serotonin um, and the and the drugs that you used uh, and demonstrated effectiveness for your research for. So we're gonna uh, kind of shift uh, towards there. Okay. Uh, so Kirby Campbell on Zoom wants to know, in your last study, is Ritalin and Serotonin uh, synergistic? Uh, meaning, would administering both dopamine uptake inhibitor and the serotonin uptake inhibitor result in an even higher degree of benefit for treatment? It's, it's possible. That's a, that's a very interesting and important question. Uh, the doses that we used for each one was what we think is the maximal effect that we're going to be able to see. It can, too much of dopamine and too much of serotonin can have negative effects. So one possibility that we are thinking about is using either each of them in, in, in combination with each other, but at much lower doses so that they don't have the side effects that they can possibly have with having too much dopamine or too much serotonin. That's a very good question. That's a, that's, and it's a really important aspect of uh, treatment strategies. Uh, so similar along that lines, uh, is there a common point in the serotonin or dopamine pathways that could explain why modulation of either mo molecule improves br brain function? Uh, from a neurochemical standpoint, not really, because the, the cell populations that make the serotonin and the dopamine are not in, in, in the same region of the brain. And the, uh, and the chemistry of uh, synthesis does not share uh, common um, um, precursors. However, the postsynaptic side, so where these projections target to, could share common receptors. So receptors for dopamine and serotonin could be on the same cells. So there could be common pathways in the regions that control the depressive behavior. So for example, one, one region is the nucleus accumbens, both, and the other region is the prefrontal cortex, medial prefrontal cortex. So it's possible that the, that the uh, postsynaptic side of this can share uh, common uh, signaling elements. So another question from Facebook, um, Anand wants to know, is Riddle, um, is Ritalin specific for dopamine, or does it also block reuptake of norepinephrine? And if the latter is true, can you differentiate between the behavioral influence of one versus the other? Sorry, Nancy, could you just repeat that? I think I lost you for just a few seconds there. What yes, the no problem. So Anon on Facebook wants to know if Ritalin is specific for dopamine, or if it might also be influencing norepinephrine. Uh, it and if if the latter is true, how can you differentiate between the behavioral uh, influence of either molecule? Then, and then actually, this, that's, a very, that's, a, that's also an important and interesting question, and that goes back to the dose of Ritalin. Uh, 
So it's a, it's a, it, it can affect both norepinephrine and dopamine uh, by, by similar mechanisms. It, it could be a dose effect uh, or it could be, an, uh, you know, there's nothing to say that other neurotransmitters, norepinephrine, for example, also does not participate in the process. So, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's something that needs to be evaluated. Uh, so switching the topic to these uh, interesting effects you're seeing uh, in males versus females, Priscilla Santos on Zoom wants to know, what is your theory as to why women are taking longer to recover from TBI? And do you believe it has anything to do with later lateralization in the male and female brain? No, so I don't, we don't think it's so much the lateralization. We do think that the hormones are playing an important part because the activity of these neurotransmitters, whether it's dopamine or serotonin or norepinephrine, it's well known that their activities are regulated by the circulating, uh, by, by the estrogen and progesterone. And so what we think is happening is that uh, those hormones are influencing how the female brain uh, response to the to the injury. In fact, we have some studies that where we've been able to regulate the expression of those hormones or the activity of those hormones and evaluate their effect on behavior. So relating uh, to hormones then, um, uh, Genevieve on Zoom wanted to know, does the phase of the estrous cycle in the animal uh, that the animal was in at the time of injury influence the uh, post-concussive symptoms that they develop? Um, so we have actually looked at that and the answer to that is no, because we, when we injure the animal, there are two, there are, but there's a caveat to that. So the simple answer is no, it does not influence it. We have injured animals in different stages, but the caveat to that is at the age that we injure the animals, which is about between 35 to 40 days old, they still have not yet come into the full estrus cycle yet. So they're still getting themselves set up to go through the estrus cycle. So rather than see the four or five different phases of the estrus cycle, you can maybe see two or three of them. So it's not until they get to about 50, 60 days of age that you can actually see the full implementation of the estrus cycle. Interesting. Um, so I'm going to wrap it up with a few more questions. Uh, so Wes on Zoom wants to know regarding recovery from the TBI process, is there any evidence showing that MCT oil consumption can benefit damaged brains? Uh, the answer to that is we, we have not done a randomized clinical trial. There's been one or two studies with uh, um, in animals, but it really hasn't gotten to the point where it's promising enough to be able to be tested in humans. Um, related to the effects on youth, uh, we have an anonymous question that wants to know, does a history of single or mild TBI in youth also correlate with chances or accelerate uh, neurodegeneration in adulthood? Yes. In fact, uh, what's been shown is that we think, uh, so going back to the football players, there was a paper that came out that said that the younger the age of the athlete when he started playing football, the more likely he was to show evidence of CTE. And I think the critical age was 12 in that paper. So it was a small cohort of studies from that CTE brain bank that Dr. McKee has. Uh, but if you, if you go back to that brain bank where there's confirmed cases of CTE and you look at the severity of the CTE, it correlates with the age at which they started playing football. Ah, oh, interesting. Um, so for another football uh, question, Kieran on Facebook wants to know, in your expert opinion, do you think that NFL player Aaron Hernandez went through CTE? <laughs> There's been some talk about that. I think it was documented that he did have CTE because once, uh, yeah, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, I believe 
that his brain was evaluated by Dr. McKee. And there was, there was definitely a report of uh, CTE. I don't know if it was specifically published in a journal or whether it was, a, it was just in the lay press, but I'm, I'm, I'm fairly certain that I remember that. All right, and uh, Zach, uh, Zach on Zoom has a, a good question that for us that will allow us to uh, kind of wrap this up as a final question. So Zach wants to know, what are the next big questions that we're trying to answer in this field uh, in terms of treatment options uh, and concussions and TBI? Yes, so that's a very good question. In fact, uh, yeah, uh, that is sort of the the, the million dollar question as it were. Uh, I guess the, the big challenge right now is uh, when do you start the treatment and how, like, and how long do you do the treatment? Because as with everything else, you know, too much or too little is not good. So to find that sweet spot of how, how long can you wait before you have to start treatment and how long do you do the treatment for? And uh, it, uh, those are the two important questions. Now, what do you treat people with? That is a whole different uh, set of questions because um, there, the, the concept that there's going to be one pill or one magic bullet that can affect every problem is, is, a, is, is, is too naive. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is the fact that I had a list of behavioral problems that manifest in these brain injured patients, whether you're, it's repetitive concussions or whether it is a motor vehicle accident. But one has to keep in mind that not every patient suffers all of those problems. So that's why I think it has to be in some way, shape or form personalized medicine because you can have certain problems, but not others. And therefore, the, those mechanisms could be different uh, from person to person. So that has to be taken into account, which speaks to the fact that you can't just give somebody a, 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 some sort of a pill the moment that they suffer the TBI. You have to wait for some time for the disease to develop, so to speak. Uh, that being said, one thing that I did want to mention to sort of wrap this up is if you look at the clinical data from the 40s and 50s to today, there has been the mortality from TBI has dropped substantially, almost by 75%. And the reason for that is because the critical care, the neurosurgical care, and the emergency care that these patients get has improved substantially. So those guidelines that were developed from the research that we, that we have done over the years has actually manifested an improved survival rate for brain injured patients. So, I, so what we have to do in the very early part, even with something like concussion, is to manage the patient, not necessarily pharmacologically. It's, it's when the drug treatment aspect of it has to come later on as the disease begins to develop, because then you begin to see what the problems are. That way you can start targeting specific mechanisms. Well, it sounds like there's, a, there's still a lot of questions out there for you to answer. So it, it looks like uh, you're in luck with the job. <laughs> uh, so um, I wanna thank you so much, Dr. Raghupathy, uh, for joining us. Uh, Taste of Science Philadelphia and, and the Taste of Science uh, group really appreciates you uh, dedicating your time uh, to come out here and teach us all more about traumatic brain injury. So thank you so much. You're welcome, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you so much. Um, and to all of our listeners, both on Zoom and Facebook, we want to thank you guys so much for tuning in. Uh, we hope that you really enjoyed this virtual event. Um, and thank you for bearing with us as we still navigate uh, bringing you these types of events uh, through virtual technology. We hope that we can bring you more through these times that we're having to stay at home. But with our in-person festival on hold, we've lost our biggest source of income.
We know these times are hard for everybody, but if you can spare anything at all, we'd be grateful if you go to tastethescience.org and hit that donate button on our homepage. We also have a post-event survey that we're sending out via email to our Zoom attendees and will be posted in the comments for our Facebook Live attendees. We'll post this to our YouTube um, channel along with links to all, so, that, uh, so you can, con along with links to all of our guests so you can continue to follow their work. And finally, tomorrow is Earth Day and in celebration of our lovely planet, we're hosting a social media sci art challenge. We want you to share how you're connected to the earth. To do so, head to tasteofscience.org to learn more about how to enter. Your submissions could be featured on our website and social media page.